The crisis in Haiti after its catastrophic earthquake is far from over. With each passing day, insecurity and uncertainty deepens for most Haitians. But what's dominated much of the news about Haiti is the orphans and the countless orphanages there. American missionaries who, in one highly reported case, have been accused of breaking Haitian law by trying to take a busload of children out of the country. For the past several years, with very little oversight, hundreds of mostly faith-based orphanages have sprung up in Haiti. They serve as drop-off points for Haitian parents who are so poor they're unable to take care of their children. Some parents turn their children over to these orphanages and what amounts to foster care. Others even give up their parental rights altogether. After the earthquake struck, producer filmmaker John Goheen made his way to Haiti and an orphanage on the edge of Port-au-Prince. It's called Ruska Village and has been run for 20 years by an American woman named Barbara Walker and a small staff of volunteers, also Americans. For the next half an hour, we watch as the turmoil that's consuming Haiti also threatens to consume these children and their caretakers. My orphanage is called Ruska Village. Feel it? We're moving. Oh, oh, I feel. Oh no, the whole room went just like that about four times. I imagine it was at least a five point. I'm not sure, but the whole building, we were in here sleeping with the babies in this room and it started shaking. Fortunately, we were all up so we could grab the babies and come outside. My heart skipped a beat with all those babies in the building. When these aftershock hits, they're quite heavy. Some of them are well, actually quakes. I've been in earthquakes before, but this was just so large. The whole building shook for at least three minutes. This is one of the houses that uh, a lady and several of the children live in, uh, the orphan children that are getting ready to be adopted out. And you can see that you're looking at the rest of the neighborhood through the back, back wall of her house. I hate to complain about what's happened to us because everybody else got hit so much worse. We lost nobody. We had such minor injuries. Uh, and there's terrible stories out there. A wall fell on her. I think she's gonna die because by the time when I find her and she already have infection on her face. She's doing a whole lot better now because we try to take care of her. And I have two of my parents, I'm not even seeing them yet. I don't know where they are. We don't know. And we try to call them, the telephone is ringing, they're not even answering. All the kids have diarrhea. The, things are really bad right now. They're all living outside. I think most of the diarrhea is emotional. But regardless of what it's causing it, it can cause death. Some of them come because they are they just neighborhood from us. They don't have no place to live and they come sleep right here with us. This is a survival mode down here. This is what people do. Right now we got Ted Village here because it's the safest spot in the yard right now. I don't even know who they are. There's people from the area and people that are related to people I've dealt with. They know I will help them. The overwhelming emotional needs. We are very afraid. At this time, you know, these people, they're upset. So we just try to, to survive with all we get, but it's finished now. We have nothing. We can't, we, we can't do nothing. There's no water, no water, no food, nothing. We want to help everybody. People come, they're hungry, we want to feed them. You go back in there, Sophie. The main thing here is to take care of babies. I've been here since August 12th, and after I came, I, I saw the need, and I fell in love with the people, and I just decided to stay. If that quake added something new to it and broke the, broke the integrity, then, then you can know really whether or not the building is, is coming down. Normal circumstances here at the village, we really need at least five volunteers. We never have that many. Everybody has just stepped up in this crisis. We feed about 100 people a day. 
there are at least 50 kids and then workers and outside people. It's gotten to be so big of a job. Babies first, adults later. Uh, there's people coming in here every day that are hungry and sick. Have all the children been fed? Now see, the children are even bringing their plates for us to use for other children because they know that we have a shortage. The more we get, the more work it is. It may not be what you'd call a sanitary, but they're not starving to death. We supply water for this whole community here. One of the things that we're really beginning in earnest today, we're going to start getting water out. Good water. And we're going to be known in this community as a source of clean water. And we've seen this again and again and again. Protect the water people. So by giving the water out, you endear yourself to a whole network of people around you. So if somebody comes in and messes with this community, they're messing with the source of water. So our line of protection is going to be our ability to produce and give clean water. Gas. Gas. And fill up the truck. Yes. Okay. Here's some more money just for shopping if you see something on the road, okay? Because we need food. All right. The Haitian culture is a very depressed culture. They've been oppressed and depressed for so many years. I hate Haiti. It's hot, it's dirty, it's, it's corrupt. It's sin in its, in its glory. I mean, the, the country is run under voodoo rules and everybody is corrupt and it seems to be socially acceptable. Tragedy after tragedy, bad government after bad government. They've learned to live from day to day. They don't think about tomorrow, they don't think about next week. Children grow up in Haiti with a goal in mind, escape. This is gold. This is what every kid needs to get out. This is the adoption agreement saying that the Haitian government social department has agreed that this child is suitable for adoption and all the papers are suitable. They give us this, we make the adoption paper, the judgment paper, have everything legalized and out of the country they can go. Visas is a long process. It's an emergency, there's no set rules. One person says you need this to get the kid out, another one says no, you need this to get a kid out. There's no conformity. The government down here is non-functional in the best of times. All the records, all the machinery, you can't get a stamp on a paper because the Justice Palace is gone, the Justice Department is gone, the Foreign Affairs is gone. Uh, the palace itself is gone. They're twins, yep. First priority, get the kids out of the country. So far, I've gotten 22 visas. In the very near future, within 30 days, the number should be nearly 60 or 70 children. <laughs> okay, hop in. Okay. <laughs> this is a perfect example of what is happening uh, here at the village. People are coming in, they're saying their houses are all caved in. They have no place to live, and please, please, please take my baby. This is your little girl. Yes. Does she understand we can't take the child today? Yes, I will. You see, we have a big yard full of children. This lady is willing to give up this child, even though she's healthy. She's been doing the best she could for this little girl. The rules are very, very strict down here. But I cannot, a penny of money means I'm buying a child. It, there's a fine line there. But it's also going to make her life a whole lot easier. She can sleep easier at night knowing that somebody else is taking care of that child and nobody's going to break in and kill her. Every single day we're turning away five to ten kids. They're begging us. I mean, they go away mad because we won't take their children. At this time, we've got such a tragedy going here and all these children that we're taking care of we cannot take her child today. Normally it's very difficult to turn her away, but after the earthquake and this terrible feeling I have about another one coming, it's really hard. We have a real sick baby. Now she's very dehydrated and, you know, and she's been throwing up and so, a, a baby too can get can go down, downhill it seems so fast and then it takes forever for them to catch up again. They're all 
kind of out of sorts and stuff just because they're not living in, you know, their normal um, living conditions. They're all outside sleeping in the dust and debris and dirt. It's hot and kids get sick quickly here. Okay. Can both of you go on a motorcycle? Yeah. Ask her. It's, it's critical right now. Bella is in a critical position. There's no quick way of getting in and out of the village to the main road. If they can get her to the doctor, if he's in, he can give her a shot. We had one child we had to do this for the other day that is severely uh, dehydrated. Dehydration is terrible. And these babies, it just doesn't take them long, you know, to just become very ill. Diesel is very hard to get. Everybody is gouging. If it, uh, even the exchange rate for money was 840 to one uh, the day before the earthquake. Now we, we, we are going to try to find some gas right now and whatever we can find, just exchange some money because Haitian money is not easy to find right now. Now if you can get 500 to one, you're, you're lucky because there's a shortage of Haitian money, believe it or not. <laughs> that is a American price and Asian price. <laughs> yeah, who ever thought that would happen? As the influx of uh, American money to help people is bringing the Haitian money exchange down low. They know we are working with uh, American, and for, for some people in Haiti, when an Haitian working with an American, they think you are a rich You have a lot man. of money. You have a lot of money. He exchanged four hundred dollars for us. They exchanged it at one hundred. Um, they exchanged six hundred and fifty. I mean, exchange they supposed to be exchanged eight forty is eight. Now it's exchanged six fifty. Everything has come down right now in Haiti. We don't know what to do, but he do his best to get four hundred exchange for us. It's better than nothing. I've had this little girl since she was a month old. Well, both of them since they were one month old. We try to reach out to as many people as come. That's that's the name of the game here. We want to help everybody. But we do have to protect our own, too. I have a responsibility for these children. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think it was the right thing to do. I could probably say 50% of the children that I have adopted would have been dead from some kind of an illness. You sit down and you start thinking about that type of stuff, and you're going to start to cry. <laughs> On the edge of Port-au-Prince, in the wake of last month's earthquake, the Ruska village orphanage has struggled to continue operating. For the past 20 years, funded primarily with donations, they facilitated nearly 800 adoptions for the children left in their care. But now the ruin left behind by the disaster has added new urgency to their life's work. I need visa. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get six kids out of here, only to follow up with a ticket right back and get another batch. David and Stephen are leaving for the U.S. Not you. No, David and Stephen. This is a biological mother of Stephen. This is Mimos. This is Stephen. Stephen and David are being adopted in Chile. She was very excited when she heard he was leaving today because she knows there's no way for her to take care of him. There's our rescue plane. Oh, that looks great on you. Oh, so pretty. Keep the sun out of your eyes. Hi, Stephen. I understand that this company uh, has volunteered their plane and their pilots for a whole week to transfer oh, people sweet. out of this country. Congratulations, little man. If you guys work with us, we'll have more at the end of this week. Doing everything we can to keep him moving. He's got more visas coming today. They gave him a receipt for eight more. I've got seats available. Bring them on. 
you know, to deliver children. I'm going by. I'm going to the United States. To see these kids go on an airplane and this horrible spirit of this country leaving them, it's overwhelmingly Bye. exciting to me. We'll be back tomorrow. Looking, it's looking pretty good today. This is baby Bella, and last night she was not doing very good. We, nobody knew if she was going to make it, but we now have her on IV, and she's a lot more perky and lively, and I think, I think she might pull out of it. Barbara sleeps in here. Yes, look at this, man. This one's clearly defined. You see that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I see it right there. I can see there's a whole new crack line right there. Everybody that's been involved in this is emotionally tired and physically tired. I want to go home. I really do. I want to see my family. Uh, I cannot, these babies, uh, most of the babies have been with me, some when they're a month old, and they're just, you know, you care for them so much. All the kids in the village, you know, they come to me because they know I'm the lady with the snacks and the food or anything kind of special. You know, I get the attention and I just can't leave at this time. But I'm looking forward to going home. I'm tired. And you hold up real well, then once in a while I crack. You know, for a little while after this is all over today, I'm gonna be in good shape again. I've shed a lot of tears. Yeah. Probably, I don't, I don't know, whenever I think about it, it, I get emotional. And so I just try to stay busy and, and then you don't think about it so much. But. We've got our brains and guts back. Thank you. I'm going to try and get out for Tuesday for 10 kids. We're going to be ready for you. Okay, we'll God here. bless we'll you. Barbara's a very hardworking lady. She's worked hard all of her life. She has been a carpenter, a school bus driver, a mother, grave digger. People that are taking shortcuts are, are really making them mad at immigration. Yeah, and they're going to pay. They're going to pay later. So. She came down here and she did see some orphanages that she did not approve of. So that's when she thought about working and um, facilitating adoptions to get some of the children out of here. And then she built her orphanage up. What's the matter, honey, huh? Oh. We're going to try and get you all out of here. Oh, this is such a mess. We do look around the village and, and every building does look intact, uh, but the truth of the matter is uh, better than half the village is going to have to be replaced because we can't send people back into a building that has cracks through the walls and foundation that you can see daylight through. You'd expect the human instinct to want to be safe and protected. We got nightfall coming on, and so as everything starts to wind down, these ladies that are charged with the responsibility of, of protecting these children and keeping them safe know that they sleep better at night when they feel like they have this wall surrounding them. And so what the ladies are doing, they're setting up the benches, they're running ropes and strings and basically anything they can to make a little barrier. We just cannot sleep in like that. And we need to make cover for ourselves. But you know, the the government not even worry about anybody right now. We just have to take care of ourselves. If we won't take care of ourselves, it's not gonna become out good for us. We just try to make our own house. Comb my hair and take a bath in two days. <laughs> <laughs>
We have 900 pounds of food in 20 boxes. It was driven from Cape Haitian to Port-au-Prince overnight, and it's all food, medical supplies. People moved real fast, and uh, I'm really impressed to see, uh, you know, just the way they mix the uh, band-aids with the beans and rice, just throwing them into things and getting them ready, how it got here this quick. I, I would love to track this and find the story of how these things got from the United States to right here. It'd be an amazing journey. This is huge. Uh, nobody, nobody is bringing things into the country like this. They're bringing water and MREs, um, but they're not bringing in formula or uh, the baby cereal that newborn babies need. So this is, this is huge because it's gonna sustain the very, very young, the infant life within, within the area. This all came from Miami through an organization there that helps Barbara here in Haiti. Hey, you wanna, you wanna see real happiness? Hey, tell them all that we got diapers, you'll see real happiness. Hey, we got diapers! I've been here 25 years now. I used to say, it can't get any worse, it can't get any worse. And that went on for about 10 years when I realized it was getting worse all the time. I keep hoping this is time to stop. I said, you know, I, I said to myself, wow, if I could get rid of all these kids, maybe I could stop. You know, maybe this is what God's telling me, it's time to go home. But then the future has a silver lining, maybe. People are donating money to rebuild. If all the money that's going into Haiti right now goes to good use and was used wisely, you could turn around this country. You really could. These two are very special. We've had them since they were brand new. There's a lot of blessings here, and we've saved a lot of kids from a lot of grief.